Hello and welcome to the In The Money Players podcast. This is our show for Friday, March 5th, covering the races of Saturday, March 6th. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornatal, back with you in the Brooklyn Bunker once again. Uh, I've got funny glasses on. I'm going to leave them on. I'm going to test them out. We're screen testing the funny blue light glasses. I'm pretty happy with them so far. Everything's gone wrong in the bunker the last few days. Uh, my my new setup has been producing some weird things going on in my head, and I'm not just talking about the thoughts in there, but dealing with some headaches. So we're bringing in a, a heavy hitter to help us out in the handicapping for Southern California today. You see the, the light went out on my In The Money podcast light box. I gotta, It's all gone wrong here, but we're going to get it fixed, and we're going to have a great show talking about not only the pick six at Santa Anita on Saturday, but also the big triple crown preps in New York and down in Florida as well to talk it all, uh, talk about it all with me. First, we'll bring in the usual co-host of this program. You can see him there. He's in his own studio on the planet Texas. He's the people's champion, Jonathan Kitchen. JK, what's up? Uh, my favorite part of this whole thing is that right before we got started, we were making fun of you being a boomer. And then the first oh thing you God. did was look at your phone to see the date like this. <laughs> hey, I'm there too, though. <laughs> I missed that designation by like a good seven years. Um, Billy, you're on the cusp. Well, we'll introduce the voice you just heard belongs to a regular on the In the Money Media Network. He is the co host of the Owner's Box, he is the co managing partner of Little Red Feather racing his institutional knowledge of California racing, something we want to tap into as often as possible. Billy Koch, how are you today? I'm great. PTF, I mean, I you're you're with me, bro. We're the boomers. There's nothing we can do about it. Just you know what? Just go with it. Just go with it. It's, we it's, can't change who we are. I th I think it's like the three year generation gap between you and me, Billy. I, I'm a I'm a proud uh, Gen Xer all the way here. I, me too. I, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Listen, we can still handicap. We still look at the form. We, you know, we're just old school. That's who we are. <laughs> uh, in racing, we're still young. That's the that that's the the, the funny bit. You know. I, um, listen, I I told my my kids last night. I think my mentality level is that of a of a nineteen year old. <laughs> so it does really doesn't. I just never grow up. Peter Pan syndrome through and through. Never grow racing. up. Horse racing can keep you uh, nice and young in terms of our itinerant lifestyle, among other Absolutely. things. Uh, Absolutely. JK, you know all about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, there's there's about four times a week I act like I'm 12 years old, so <laughs> it happens to all of us. <laughs> Let's dive into these races, because I know Billy's on a clock, and I want to allow us to be able to talk as much as we want about all the doings at Santa Anita on Saturday Pretty cool card with uh, maybe I'll even go ahead and say a little more star power than expected. We're going to kick things off talking about this pick six. It starts in race number six, 545 Eastern it will go. It's the grade two San Felipe Stakes mile on a 16th, obviously for three-year-olds with 300,000 in the pot. Return to the races of life is good. Really interesting race. Billy, as the guest, we're going to start you off with this one, what's going to be your wagering approach to this race? Where do you stand with life is good and all the rest? We're, we're talking pick six. And when we talk about pick six, we talk about, you know, creating a sequence. Life is good is the, is going to be a big favorite and he's going to be a short price. So I think as a player, you have to decide in this particular instance, whether you're singling or you're going to try to beat him. And what I like to do sometimes is actually I'll make two tickets. So I'll make a life is good ticket, and then I'll make a ticket trying to beat him. Because if he wins, I know I'm going to have to use some other prices throughout the rest of the sequence. Um, and if he doesn't, then I can cut down that other sequence and, and, and use some of the shorter prices. So um, I think he's the best horse in the race. I think the rail draw, I, I literally just talked to Jimmy Barnes walking in the track. They love the fact that they drew the rail because there's going to be no mystery. He's going to be going. He will be in front. And then, you, you know, there's question marks surrounding a lot of the horses. And, you know, Dream Shake obviously was brilliant last time. That's the Pete Erton. Um, but he has to stretch out to two turns after just one sprint. And he ran a one on third graph. We talk a lot about third graph. That's kind of my, my model. 
Um, Medina Spirit's been nothing but game. The great one out of nowhere runs a one and wins by 14 lengths. I know my buddy Bill Strauss loves this horse coming into the race on Saturday. And then Roman Centurion is a huge price. He's 8-1, to one and all he's done is improved in every single start and almost beat Medina Spirit last time. I think Life is Good is the most probable winner as the favorite, but, and that's a big but, if you feel like spreading, make that second ticket and use some of the other logicals. I mean, I, 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 that that's kind of my theory in this race. You can you can make a case that Life is Good is just single. He's going to go wire to wire, call it a day. It's Baffert. He's on the derby trail. Or you could try to get cute. If I held your feet to the fire, Billy, for one of those other runners you mentioned who you'd want on that other ticket, who would it be? For me, that would be Dream Shake based on what we saw, based on the hands that he's in. I feel like there's some chance this one's going to improve again. He's going to have to improve to catch Life is Good, but I do want some twos in addition to the ones on my pick six ticket. How about How about for you? I would probably lean to the great one. Um, I think he was obviously super impressive last time. You don't just win by 14 lengths. I know maybe he didn't beat much, but he did just get beat by Spielberg, who I, I've always kind of underrated. Maybe he finished second the other day in the stake. Um, and notice that Cedillo stays here. He could have ridden Medina Spirit. I think that's a big deal. Uh, the horse has been working great. You're probably going to get that 4-1. to one. That's where I would lean if I was trying to beat Life is Good. That's an interesting little jockey musical chair angle. JK, let's bring you in to sort this one out for us. Will the silver wig be in effect? Um, and if it is, is it just for uh, Life is Good? How do you see this one? Yeah, I mean, it is. I, I mean, I'll be ice cold. The Life is Good um, for a couple of reasons. One is because, you know, I, I think the last race was, was, was one that people have lots of different opinions about. My opinion was, was that... Mike was sitting on the best horse and he was going to win for fun. And it wasn't the goal. The goal was not the sham. So let's just let this horse kind of gallop around there. Young horse lost interest. I think Bob and uh, Mike learned something that day. They learned what they had underneath them. They learned some habits the horse might have. I'm sure they tried to break some of those habits in the morning. And I'm sure Mike won't allow him to fall asleep. It reminds me a lot of authentic, you know, he kind of fell asleep in the Haskell and everyone, including me discounted the horse. And then he comes back and he wins our two most important races in this country. I think life is good. I love the rail draw. Cause I think he'll be aggressive. And then Mike will get off of the rail and kind of get out into the three path on the backside. And, and every other one of these horses that I can make a case for, I have a negative on dream shake stretching right. out for the first time Medina spirit. That was a really impressive performance. He's just not as fast as life is good. And and he's trained by the same guy. They're not going to ding dong with each other. No. And, and you know, so um, I think Abel got, I don't think he got fired, but I think that Bob picked Johnny instead of Abel. So I think Abel, that's why I think Abel ended up on the other one. So uh, uh, I don't know about, but do you have any inside info there, Billy? Or are you just, oh, uh, yes. I know, I listen, I, 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 I know the owners of the great one and I, my, my gut instinct is Abel went with the great one. I, and I don't think Bob cared. I'm going to stick. I, I agree with JK. I don't think Bob, I don't think Bob was devastated to get Johnny V. So <laughs> I think it just worked out for everybody. How's that? I like it. Enough. You might have a future in politics with answers like that, Billy. That was, that hey, was I do it all the time on the pod. Bro. <laughs> hey, how, how, hey, how, how the hell did, Bob, did, did Billy show up with the best studio in his beautiful suite at Santa Anita while I'm sitting here, you know, in my, you, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I should have announced that you are on location watching some horses uh, work this morning. Listen, we got, we got to be careful. We could go down 18 rabbit holes and, and then you're going to miss this breeze you, you're out good. there for. Don't worry about it. We're good. We'll, we'll move it along to leg B. Uh, race number seven, 620 is the schedule post time. One mile on the turf for first level allowance types four and up. JK, we're going to start with you here. Look, I loved Whisper Knot last time, and the, it was one of those. And look, I think he's an unbelievable rider. I think he's a great rider. I think Billy will express the exact same thing I'm going to say right now. Eight times you're going to get that brilliant Joel Rosario ride, and then two times you're going to get that what the hell is this guy doing ride. And I think that's what happened last time on Whisper Knot. He, he, he went out there and fought him for half a mile. And then I just, I hated the ride. I think he'll run better this time. I think Joel would ride him better this time. I think Joel probably learned his lesson. I, I like Rip City. I just hate the ownership. 
I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, um, I think Rich City's interesting as well. Tough yeah. guys to root for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, real tough guys to root for. Oh. So I, those are the two for me. I, I think that I like tactical horses that are drawn inside in turf races in California. It's a new thing I've discovered, and I like it, especially with good riders. And so those are the two that I'm going to build a lot of what I'm doing around. But there's other horses you have to consider. Gogon is a horse I've always wanted to, to try to fall in love with. And I like the fact that he'll be making his first start in California, East coast turf horse coming out West. I'll build a lot around those three horses. Billy, how is rip city doing and what uh, will be your approach in the pick six of this race? You know, uh, obviously I have to single rip city. We do own him. He's been a joy to have in the barn. Uh, Mike pipe. He's done a great job with him. Obviously his four race win streak was snapped last time, but he was doing something he really didn't want to do. And if you look at that race, there was no speed. And intentionally, we just put Rip City on the lead because there literally was no speed in the race. And that's why he was in front. I think he wants to be tactical. If you look at his races before that, his four races, he sits and finishes. And that's what he wants to do. And in this spot, I think he could get that perfect trip. Whisper Not is by far the horse to beat. And JK, we call that being Rosario'd. That's our <laughs> term. So you can get rosario and that, that happens. It's a, it's a legit, it really does happen, believe me. I can bring up videos. But um, Whisper Not is the fastest horse. He's the best horse. And if he gets the right trip and Pratt can get him to relax, that's the key. You're going to know about this horse, you know, as they pass the wire for the first time. And if he's tugging, he's in trouble. I loved him last time too, JK, and took the one to two and was crying afterwards. I think, I think the only horse that can put pressure on him might be Tripoli or Tripoli, however you want to say it. Um, and if they those two kind of go off and he puts some pressure on Whisper Knot, I think Rip City's going to be in a great spot. He does need to move up numbers-wise, but I think he can. And I, I'm, I, most of my bets will be Rip City and Whisper Knot. I will he say makes- this about Trip, uh, Tripoli. No other rider should ride him except for... Rispoli. <laughs> Rispoli Tripoli. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Perfect. So. Completely, completely. I agree. Completely silly stuff, but uh, but I appreciate it. Uh, Billy breaking out his best uh, Benny South Street impression there with this uh, with some of his uh, some of his remarks. Let's move on to race number eight, gentlemen. The Grade Two San Carlos Stakes, six fifty two. The scheduled post time seven furlongs on the dirt, four and up, two hundred thousand in the pot. Billy, we go back to you. You know, this is one of those races that I was able to eliminate horses to get to my horse. Um, and if you look, cause I storm the court going turf, dirt, cutting back, not my favorite thing to do. Major cabby comes off a lawn layoff. Manhattan up is just too slow. Strong constitution. Not sure why he's in here. Exalted. I don't really like he's too slow. So that leaves you with a, a brickyard ride. As far as I'm concerned, he, he is a massive bounce candidate. He ran so good last time and so fast. He comes back. I, I believe even though he's four for five at Santa Anita, he has a big chance of blowing up. And that leaves me with three horses, the two Extra Hope, the eight Loudmouth, and the nine Tigre de Sluggo. I love the nine. Goes from inside to outside. He got rosario last time. We just talked about it. He had a brutal trip if you go watch that race. He was absolutely full of run late. He gets the added distance. He's five to two on the morning line. I think you're going to get that. I don't know how much he's going to get bet. Obviously, I'm a big fan of Pipey. I root for Sluggo. Um, and I think this horse gets an ideal stalking trip with some speed and can run him down late. That's a that's a kind of a big play for me. I think just if you look, J.K. was talking about inside on the grass, outside on the dirt sprinting is a major benefit here in Southern California, and I think he's in the right spot. I'd agree with both of those assessments. J.K., how do you see this one? What are your numbers in race number eight? Yeah, I'm a sucker for outside on the dirt, especially in these sprint races. Um, I, like, I like the nine. And, and, and here's the thing with, with Joel, we, 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 can, we make fun. But when he when he does make a mistake, he typically comes back and gives you that Hall of Fame brilliant ride that you need. Um, I like the nine in here. Um, I thought the eight was just kind of interesting at a price. Just to give you a heads up, I'm a little spready in this spot because I'm going to be pretty tight in other spots. Sure. Um, Exalted, I thought, was a little bit interesting on the little slight cut. I'm sorry, he's running seven. I thought yeah. Exalted was a little bit interesting, just that outside kind of vibe again. I think he'll get a good trip. Um, and then the other one that I wanted was extra hope on the cutback. I wish he was drawn outside. I'd love the horse drawn outside. I agree. I agree. Uh, the cutback, I think, is interesting. Storm the court. Uh, I love Ryan X line. This horse, I just can't. I just can't really figure him out. Um, 
So I'm going to be using a lot in here, but I'm going to key off the nine for sure. I think T grade to Sluggo is, is, is the most likely winner in the race. You mentioned four, JK. How would you grade them into A's and B's? Just the nine as an A, eight, seven, two as B's for uh, purposes of my little notepad here? Yeah, you know what I'm going to do, honestly, the, the honest answer is, is when the workout report comes, if T-grade uh, DeSluggo has one of those B pluses, he's the type of horse that could be a single A for me. If he's looking at B minus type of situations off of that short break, then he might be a horse that I, I want to include some other ones as well. This is going to be a workout race for me on who's going to end up where. I'm, I just know for sure T. Gray to Sluggo will be an A horse. Uh, Brickyard Ride is a horse that could get pushed back to a B if things don't look like I want them to look. Um, and I'd like to probably use Extra Hope as an A just because I like the idea of the cutback. This horse has been knocking on the door of being a good horse for a while with some pretty big performances, and maybe the cutback helps him. It, I'm just being honest. It really yeah. is going to depend on how they work out. Oh, I can put that in the notes. So that's exactly uh, what we'll do. Appreciate that assessment. And that's a great point that your approach to this race is predicated on your thoughts elsewhere and how narrow you can get in some, uh, in some other places. Let's move on to race number nine, grade one action. First of, uh, of a couple of grade ones on the card, Frank E. Kilrow mile, obviously one mile on the turf four and up 726 Eastern, the scheduled post time for this one. And JK, we'll keep it with you. Is this one of these places you're going to get narrow because it uh, seems like there's some talented runners in here. Yeah, this is a East goes West uh, turf situation for me, but I'm not using the Chads. I, I just don't think Flavius and Spirit Animal are very good. Um, my A horses are going to be Social Paranoia, who I think is a very underrated racehorse. Uh, Casa Creed, another one who he's kind of been a punchline in some of the races he shows up in, but he runs. Um, and the fact that Bill Mott put him on a plane and brought him out here, I don't think that's any uh, – I think that's that's something you might want to lean on. And then ride a comment from Mark Cassie is another one. He ran well last time at Gulfstream Park. So I'm going to build around those as my A horses. And then I will use, um, uh, where are we at here? Uh, smooth like straight and hit the road is B. Smooth like straight is interesting. I thought he had a huge speed edge last time. He didn't take advantage of that. He ended up kind of taking back uh, with Rispoli. And, and, and the instructions were basically go to the front, go to the front. He couldn't make the lead. And I'm not sure if he'll make the lead here. He could, but I'm not sure if he will. He's going to have some real horses running after him, though. Uh, but I respect the horse. I'm just going to use the one and the two as B's. I'll use those other East Coast horses as A's. With Social Paranoia being your top selection? Social Paranoia will be my top choice, yeah. Billy, I, we've, I've heard you speak uh, extensively on uh, on the shows about uh, a few of the runners in these races. Very curious how you ended up uh, seeing it this year in the kill row. What, what are your well, thoughts? Well, JK is right. Smooth like straight will not be in front. That's because of the presence of Flying Scotsman who's going to make the lead from his outside post. He's going to be gunned for the lead, and that's going to change the whole complexion of the race. It'll allow horses like Smooth Like Straight and Hit the Road from their inside posts to get good positions. I think those are one, two, three as they hit the first turn. Um, this is an interesting race. I think you have to spread. I'm with JK on that. Um, Smooth Like Straight is a really, really good horse, but he's been beaten up on three-year-olds. He makes his four-year-old debut against really good horses, and he's going to have to really, he's going to have to go way forward to win this race. And that's what we're looking for here as we're talking pick six. We're talking about horses that can win. Hit the Road is an amazing animal. I'm a big fan of Dan Blacker. My sister works for him. My sister's going crazy right now. She's so excited. She's completely washing out. She's walking around her stall all day, and it's already, it's only, it's just Friday. It's been happening for two days since the draw. But this horse ran a one last time on the sheets after his best was a six. There's a possibility of a bounce. Rispoli, who is, he and Pratt just dominate out here, chooses smooth like straight, whether it was a political move or the best horse move. I'm not sure. I lean towards political to ride for Mike McCarthy. Giroux is a capable uh, replacement, but he doesn't know the horse. And I think that's interesting. So I think those two have knocks against them. I would lean exactly where JK was going to the horses from the East Coast. We've seen it a million times when they come out here. The social paranoias, the Casa Creeds. I would use Flavius just because he has Flavian, Flavius. Are we sticking with the <laughs> jockey name combo? Um, I would also, I'm going to throw in Count again because he's even money last time for Phil D'Amato. No one's been hotter on the grass than Phil D'Amato. He, he was even money last time. He's going to be a big price last time because he ran terrible. The question is, did he bleed? Did he slip? No one really knows the answer. But at 12, 15 to 1 for a horse that was even money against the, the best we had out here last time, 
I think he's he's worthwhile to put on a B ticket or a C ticket, however you guys are doing your ABCs. So I'm with JK on the on the whole East Coast thing here, but I would throw in some of the West Coasters as as just little nibbles. Help me out, Billy. Grade mm-hmm. some of these into mains and backups for me. I would go A's with uh, social paranoia. I would use Flavius, Casa Creed, Ride a Comet, those four, and then I'd be on uh, Count Again. Um, and then I would, I'd see on, on smooth, like straight and hit the road just to have them on a ticket somewhere. Okay. That makes perfect sense. All right. <clears throat> the big spread so- race. This is a really, really, really good race. And it's worthy of a grade one. These are good horses. There's no superstars, but it's a really, really good race. Competitive. You mentioned the politics out there. Nobody wants to run afoul of Mike McCarthy. That's for sure. He's a, he's one tough customer. He, he is. And you know what? And, and he, do, and he, he's done right by Rispoli. He rides a lot of good horses for him. Do I, I listen, you have to have a philosophy as a jock agent and a rider. Where do you want to be? Hit the road might be better right now than Smooth Like Straight, but I know down the line I'm going to have a lot more opportunities with McCarthy, with McCarthy than Dan Blacker. And that's just fact. It is what it is. Let's move on to race number 10. The grade one Santa Anita handicap, the big cap. 10 furlongs on the dirt for four and up with 400,000 in the pot. Billy, we're going to have you kick this one off. Uh, Maybe the easiest way to to start the conversation about this race is, are you with or against Maxfield? You know, I'm with Maxfield with one little one little tweak, and that is that the Santa Anita track, and I think JK will agree with this, is very different than a lot of tracks in America. It is deep. And if you don't handle it, if you can't get over it, you're in trouble. And we've seen it before when horses come out here, especially over the last two years with the changes that they've made. So I love Maxfield. I think he's an awesome horse. I think he's probably the best older horse, and it could be the best older horse in training right now. And and he, but he's got a lot to prove, and he has to get over the track. So again, like I said, with life is good. It depends on kind of where you go early for where you go here, because I think Maxfield's the most likely winner at a short price. And if you don't use him, you kind of do. You need to spread. I thought Express Train was impressive last time. He beat Tis a Magician and Idol. Where are they going to be in here? I think. I think it's interesting, Idol. I know people, this is the one of those, and, and JK and, and PTF, you'll, you'll hear me on this. You know when the horse is really well bet last time, Huge comes in and he kind of runs a strange race. I thought he was ridden weird by Saez that day. Now Richie, who's heating up, goes to Rosario. He's not going to be even money. Everybody's just going to look at his last race. He lost to these horses. I think he's an interesting long shot, and I would include him on tickets just for that factor. You see it so many times. People, when they're betting, they just look at the last race, and they don't necessarily go down the page. This horse is young, improving, and he's run fast. Not as fast as Max Field and, and Independence Hall, and even Kiss Today Goodbye, but he's got that Rosario factor, change of jockeys, and I know Baltus has always liked this horse. Interesting stuff there. I'll just put in a quick word for Express Train, who feels like one who's laid out to produce a big effort in this race. And the three to one of the morning line, if that were to materialize, I feel like that would be good value into the teeth of Maxfield, who I love. But eight to five, there, there's a few too many uh, attendant questions for me. You mentioned one of the main ones, Billy, with the uh, the, the unfamiliar racetrack. How about no Lasix, too, for Maxfield? JK, are Absolutely. you... Are you with or against Maxfield? It's funny when you said when you when you started your thing about express train, I thought you were stopping in the middle of the show to do an express bet read. So I thought you were just, I thought you were going, well, speaking of express bet, I thought, I thought he was going, yeah, Trevor. Where's the Trevor impression? That's what I was waiting for. I didn't know they were sponsor. Um <laughs> All right, so I'm with you on the Maxfield thing. You know, you know me. I love a short price, but there's so many questions. It's right. back off of three weeks in a, in, a, in, a, in a career that's never seen that. What does that mean? Trying the mile and a quarter for the first time. What does that mean? Why is I, I still don't completely understand why he's not going to the Dubai World Cup with the ownership group. I guess because they have missed a guide, but I, still, that's a little weird to me. Um, the no Lasix thing, like you mentioned, weird to me. Facing good older horses, weird to me. On of shipping, there's just a lot. That, there's a lot of questions. You're right, which makes it hard for me to latch on to him. He probably wins, right? But I'm picking Independence Hall. Um, 
I remember talking to Michael McCarthy prior to the Pegasus, and McCarthy was, you know, look, I, I got a good horse. He's training lights out. I just think these are deep waters, and he ran well that day. He ran really well, really and I think that he'll uh, he'll continue to improve. And remember, Independence Hall was a superstar as a young horse, and, and maybe he's kind of figuring it out now. So I'm going to try to beat Maxfield with him. I will use Maxfield as an A-horse as well. He's just too talented to try to completely toss unless you have a strong opinion that you want to try to beat him. But I'm going to lean on Independence Hall. The other thing about Independence Hall, and, and, and it kind of goes to a lot of these horses and a theme we've been talking about, is Independence Hall has successfully run without Lasix. Correct. So we know that he can. And in fact, his best performance from a speed figure standpoint was without Lasix. So that's comforting to me. He's also been training over this deep racetrack that Billy mentioned. There's a lot of things to like about him, including the price. So um, those are the ones that are interesting in Express Train, uh, expressbet.com. Express Train is another one who ran well without Lasix. And so, you know, he, he's one that I think you want to consider as well for John Sheriffs. Those horses continue to improve. Third off a break for a John Sheriffs trainee feels like the right race for that one. So he'll be a B for me just because on talent, I prefer the other two. Makes sense. It's funny because we do have a sponsor for this segment and they are Express Bet adjacent, but it's not actually Express Bet. And I don't know if I'm supposed to call them Express Bet or First Bet anyway. Somebody <laughs> will straighten me out at some point and we'll get this. Uh, I got we'll a quick it. question for JK. I got a quick question. Yeah, yeah. Independent call distance, mile and a quarter. Did you ever think he could get a mile and a quarter? Um, you know, I, I think it's the same question that we have about life is good and about greatest honor and about all of these young horses. You, you see their talent and you look at their pedigree and you guess and hope. That's why the first Saturday in May is the special day that it is because you have sure. no idea. Uh, yeah. You've got, you know, you've got uh, city zips that run uh, run good on Derby Day like Improbable did. And then you've got, sure. you know, scat daddies out of city zip mares that aren't supposed to and they win triple crowns. And then you got American Pharaoh <laughs> uh, who, who's, whose mom was a sprinter and won a triple crown and then won the mile and quarter Breeders' Cup. So um, here's what I'll say is that Constitution, there's no reason why a horse by Constitution won't go a mile and a quarter. And the average winning distance of the mare is like seven and a half. So, okay. Which is pretty high. I, that's just been my that's been my knock on him. I just never. That's my one knock. I think he's a really, really good horse. Obviously, very talented, and he should get a good trip in here. So I, I think about that billion, and you, you you've owned a lot more horses than me, probably seven hundred and eighty four <laughs> more than the one percent that I owned. I was going to say together, if Billy's owned seven hundred eighty four together, your number is seven hundred eighty five. So you know. <laughs> um, it feels like the the distance question is so much bigger when these horses are younger. And we're always asking that question when they're... Well, sure, because once they prove it, then then it's over. But yes, 100%. You're you're exactly right. He just needs to prove it to me. And maybe he doesn't. Maybe he does it on Saturday. It'll be interesting to see. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a really cool card as we're looking through this. Um, a lot of interesting questions, a lot of interesting opportunities. Um, and, and this pick six definitely opens up. Maxfield's going to be a horse that's, you know, I agree. It's, I'm not going to necessarily be a hero and, and play fully against him, but you can see things opening up um, if you can get him beat with one of the potential alternatives. All right, Billy, you got, are you, you got another like three minutes for us, Billy? I'm good. No, I'm good. I'm, I'm looking at the tractors right now. We're still going, so I got oh. plenty of time. We can do this last race, and uh, Perfect. you know, to be honest, and I mentioned it earlier, the the California scene is predicated by our workout reports. And when you're you're talking about a bunch of first time starters in the last race, you really don't know until you take a look at all nine reports, and then they don't match up, and you're like, what was what everybody we're, we're looking at? I have no idea. Um, I do know that following C is the Baffert uh, with Johnny V, uh, Spendthrift Homebred by Run Happy, who has not had much success, but he appears to be maybe turning a corner. I know this horse can run. I don't believe he is a superstar, uh, but he did draw outside, and and I'm sh- and I've heard he's fast. Um, interesting, you know, the Brian Corner. Uh, Brian had a tough start to Santa Anita, but he's won with two first-time starters in the last two weeks. Um, both Calbreds, this is obviously an open, but Sam Siegel, who's an amazing owner, an amazing person, they paid 300000 for this uh, son of street boss, but drew inside, but did land Pratt. And I think that's interesting because Corner doesn't necessarily ride Pratt all the time. This horse, I imagine, can run a little bit. And obviously, when you look at races like this, and I think JK will agree with me, and I'll throw it to him after this, 
when you look at races like this, experience counts, especially uh, when you have a bunch of firsters and you have a horse like Mr. Impossible that have has run against Concert Tour and Dream Shake and Harbor Memories, who runs later today. Um, I think Rispoli made a mistake last time rushing this horse into the race. I think Mr. Impossible at four to one on the morning line. I, I don't see him being four to one. I think he's probably. I think he's the most probable winner in the race is Mr. Impossible, just because of the experience and who he's the company that he has kept. JK, you agree with that? Yeah. Look, I you know I've it took me a long time to accept the fact that these highly touted first time starters are at a disadvantage for horses that have popped out of the gate in a race and had a colored saddle cloth over their back three or four times. Yep. Just They just kind of understand what the heck's going on a little bit better than these firsters. So I agree. I think Mr. Impossible had a lot of excuses in the last race. And you said, you know, has faced some pretty talented horses and has taken money into the teeth of all of those horses. Yeah. Remember, the fastest horse in the world, Bezos, was <laughs> – this horse was four to one that day into the teeth of Bezos. Uh, so right. there's obviously some some buzz around him. I will add to your point about Flavian Pratt and, 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 and our buddy Ryan Exline. I hopefully won't be mad at me for sharing this, but he told me to, to keep an eye out for his horse in the last. He said the horse is pretty good. He'll be 20 to one. He said Flavian Pratt really liked the horse and wanted to ride, but had to ride another one. And hmm. so this idea that the corner can probably run is probably true. Yeah. And, and, and so the other idea is maybe as a B or a C throw in the, uh, the Peter Ert and the seven, I guess that's cherubic factor. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, why not? I hope it came out right. Yeah, yeah. that's good. No, factor. Thank you, Pete. Listen, I'm especially with the with the run of of kind of we'll call it favorites. You have a Maxfield. Life is good. You if you're going into that last leg, you'd love to have a 20 to, 20 to one shot on your ticket like that that could pull off. That's how you're going to get paid, and that's the most important. We talk about on this show the last time we talk about value. We talk about how do you create value in a card that. Life is good might is the most likely winner. A horse like Maxfield is the most likely winner. You you might even have two singles there. How do you create value in the rest of the races, especially even in the seventh when we talk about Rip City and Whisper Not? Those two horses are going to be the two favorites. So if you're you have to try to find value somewhere. And JK, I think it's a great approach in that last race for a bunch of unknowns to try to get the value. I like the sound of it. All right, guys, we're going to keep going here. But, Billy, we're going to let you rock and roll. Enjoy your breeze. Thank you for your time today. You did not disappoint. Very entertaining stuff. And, again, just great uh, great knowledge. Check Billy out on the owner's box. I've learned something every show I've listened to. This is, uh, this is great stuff, folks. And, w- w- obviously, if you're in the business, if you're interested in getting into the business, it's great for that. But just as a horse player, you're going to pick up a lot of tidbits. So uh, check it out. It's a lot of fun. A lot of fun, and hey, Pete, we appreciate being part of your network, and you and JK have, have you know, opened arms and, and let my, Michelle and I in, and it, it has been so much fun. We love all the people that we've had on the show, including Ryan X-Line, who came on a couple weeks ago, and Mark Martinez, and Bill Strauss, and I got a note from Eric Johnson yesterday saying he loves the show. It's really nice when we're part of something, you know, and I feel like we're part of a family, and I just want to re- tell you guys how much we appreciate it. Well, thank you. And thank you for, for pinch hitting and keeping me from that extra hour of screen time last night. My eyes, thank you. Uh, and I thank you. And, and as far as being on the network, the pleasure is all ours. Billy, we'll see you soon. All right, guys. I want to tell you about our friends at digitalrealestatecoaching.com. We've been working with them on our website. They know their stuff. This is a coaching program that teaches contractors how to generate new customers online without paying for marketing or advertising every month. It's also more than that. It's a way to learn about an interesting new business that I could see being a pretty cool side hustle for a lot of horse players learning about the brave new world of digital real estate. Uh, This is a, a terrific way to promote your company and learn about uh, a very interesting area of business online. Check it out, digitalrealestatecoaching.com, digitalrealestatecoaching.com. All right, we were joking before about sponsors on this show. One of the things bringing this show to you is our friends at the Stronic Group with the Golden Hour Double and the Golden Hour Pick 4. That's that connect the last two and four races, respectively, at Santa Anita and Golden Gate. Player-friendly stuff. These bets, low takeout, higher minimums, reducing the edge of the non-human players involved in some of these markets. I'm a big believer 
always like to talk about him, especially this week. We've got the interesting last two races at Santa Anita. We just talked about connecting to the last two at Golden Gate. We'll probably talk about Golden Gate a little bit later in the show, but let's get the handicapping portion of things taken care of first. The first Golden Hour race up north is Golden Gate Race 8 on the all-weather. Five and a half furlongs, four and up starter allowance types. I was going to try to use three if I could afford it in here. The two ecologist I was interested in has improved of late, might be the best closer in this group, and I just thought would be sharp and could hopefully repeat or step up a little bit coming back in 13 days. I wanted to use the six exhortation in this race. I think the overall form looks a little cloudy, but if you just look at the two starts since the gelding, it comes into focus and is much better. I just felt like 10 to one looked potentially overpriced against this group. Uh, I would be remiss not to mention the three night gig just seems obvious off of that last figure. And this is the second start off a long layoff. I don't necessarily trust at a short price. That's why I'm mentioning third, uh, but I'm going to try to use some combination of two, six, and three in the golden hour pick four leg B. JK, let's bring you back. What do you think? I'm going to do the trusty uh, all but one. Um, you and Anthony Matera, that, uh, you, love, you love the all but one. It's funny. And, and it's, I remember we were sitting in the Eddie Logan suite one time making a group ticket. And uh, uh, Duke was writing down the ticket to play it for all of us, Duke Matisse. And I said, uh, you know, that was my leg. I said, all but one. He goes, no, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> he, he shut it down pretty quick. That's um, it was actually a lie. It was Blake Jesse who talked the other day on the show about how he loves the all but one. He'll be back with us for the plus podcast we're going to do about the other Tampa Bay stakes. We will be covering the Derby a little bit later, but so you're all but one in this race. Who, who's the, is the one you're, you're leaving out one of the three that I mentioned? No, I don't need the rail horse. Um, you know, I think you made a good case for, for a lot of, them. I don't want to repeat over, you know, ecologist, obviously he seems to be improving the dirt race two back was really good. And then obviously got the job done uh, at golden gate last time night gig. I need tis a speed bomb has some big races, has some tactical speed, can always kind of get themselves in a position. Those horses are dangerous, should be illegal. There's a lot of things that should be illegal, but they aren't. This horse on back-to-back -back wins, I can't toss a horse that's won two races on this surface at this distance uh, against a group that uh, is, is a wide-open race. So I'm going to use that one as well. And then you made the case for the outside horse exhortation as well. The, two, the, the figure two back uh, makes this horse the winner, and I love the outside draw at Golden Gate. It seems to work really well. Good stuff there. If you had to grade them into A's and B's, how would you do it? Or do you really see it as just even? Yeah, this is an even situation. Because if you look back to the Santa Anita handicap, I'm going to use uh, two A horses there with Maxfield and uh, uh, Independence Hall. And then uh, use one B horse with uh, with uh, the Express Bet horse, <laughs> Express Trade. And then in the in the final race at Santa Anita, I got a couple of A's and, and, and only one B. So I feel like I'm in a good spot right here to get this race covered, race eight. And then race nine, we'll try to get skinny again if we can. I think you can. We'll move on to that right now. Uh, the Golden Hour bets pay off with Golden Gate Fields. Race number nine, 845 Eastern scheduled post time one mile on the all weather non winners of two claiming types and i i thought my sunshine might have these over a barrel jk number one just looking at sectional times looked like might be the best one early looked like might be the best one late i think my sunshine could be long gone in this spot curious to see if you agree or have anything clever but it's all about my sunshine for me yeah, that's an A for me. I need one more A, and I don't need any Bs, and that is the six Dirt Road Red. It's Jonathan Wong, first time. He's got a great first name, but he's also got a great record. With he spells first it wrong. Time. Yeah, he does spell it wrong. No, my mom spelled it wrong. Well, he's got a great record with horses that are switching to his barn for the first time. First start with him. He's had 647 attempts with 182 wins. That's 28% the first time a horse goes to his barn. I think this horse will improve and could get the job done. And I like to draw better towards the outside versus being down on the inside. All right, we'll come back. We're going to have to talk about the Golden Gate situation, as we'll refer to it. But I want to do the rest of the handicapping, and we'll loop back to that. Let's come all the way back to the East Coast, down the block from where I sit right now in the Brooklyn Bunker, to talk about the Gotham 
race number nine on the Saturday card. Three-year-olds going a flat mile over that aqueduct dirt. And I was a a little bit uncreative in here, I'm going to say, JK. I really like the three highly motivated in the spot. This is a horse that just looked so good doing it at Keeneland in the stake race. If you build in speed figure improvement for age, looking at the pedigree, the hands he's in, I don't see the mile being any type of issue for highly motivated. And I think the race is also going to be run perfectly to suit. I think he's going to get the stalk and pounce trip that he wants. I might just single highly motivated. I like him that much. Uh, what do you think? Well, silver wig could be in effect here. Uh, very curious how you see the Gotham. And if you think I'm oversimplifying it. No, I don't, I don't think so. I will say this just as a reminder, usually you ask me at the end, but while it's in my brain, let me forget a fun show on Saturday on, on Fox. We've got, it's an hour show from five to six Eastern. We have the Gotham, the Tampa Bay Derby, the San Felipe, and the last, I think, from Aqueduct. So make sure you check that out. It should be a fun, tight hour show. Um, look, it feels like they're going to run in this race, right? I mean, we've talked about this before. Bob Baffert doesn't put horses on a plane and rate them. He puts them on a plane, and he tries to take advantage of what they're good at, what they've been trained to do, which is to run horses off their feet and to be fitter and tighter than their opponents. And I think Freedom Fighter will go to the front and try to do that. The problem is, is there is some other speed in the race. Capo Kane's in the race, wipe the slate. We also have to keep in mind that for the last couple of weeks, the inside has been where you wanted to be at Aqueduct, and I don't see Freedom Fighter getting there. I don't see him getting to the inside with those other speed horses to the inside. Who I do see getting to the rail is the horse that you like and the horse that I like as well. The three highly motivated should be able to break away from there and end up in behind that three horse press for the lead and sit that perfect trip. And then Javier's got a choice to make. Does he want to stay inside and wait for the rail to open or does he want to go outside? As long as he spends a majority of the inside of the time on the inside, I think he's going to be hard to beat. And, and really, it boils down to one thing. This horse ran a 108 time form figure at Keeneland early in November, Breeders' Cup weekend. If he has any improvement from two to three all the way until March, this horse is going to be extremely hard to beat. And he's trained by someone who does not give me any concern of running horses off 120 day layoff. So, are you stone cold as well, or will you have uh, Freedom Fighter as a backup? I will use Freedom Fighter as a backup as a as a I will use him as a backup, but I will also use Capo Kane as a backup because I, I I think Freedom Fighter is the better horse, but I think Capo Kane is the speed horse that could get to the rail. And so I have to, I can't use I can't discount that the way that it's been playing. Now, we got racing today, it's Friday. We've got early racing, we've got eight races before this race. If somehow the racetrack is different this week than it has been then I would be fine sing, using uh, Freedom Fighter as a B horse, uh, it's the single B horse instead of using Capo Kane. But if the track is like we've seen it been, I, I need to use him as a B horse as well. Let's move south to Oldsmar, Florida for the Tampa Bay Derby. Grade two, three year olds going a mile and a 16th. It's race number 11. What time is it? It's going to be uh, 525 Eastern, this affair. JK, I'll let you kick this one off. Yeah, you know. Uh, here's the thing. Candyman Rocket was very impressive last time. He's got a race over the racetrack, which is also a positive. The only thing that I can really knock about him is he's, he, he won the last race. He won the prep. They're going to bet him like he can't lose. And he's drawn inside. Historically, being on the inside at Tampa Bay is not where you want to be. Um, he's going to have a target on his back now. And I, I just think he's vulnerable. Now, am I tossing him? By no means. But I think the 11 towards the outside promise keeper is interesting. You get Todd Bletcher, you get Luis Saez. I understand that promise keeper had that big performance on a sloppy racetrack, but I, I, I still think that there's going to be enough meat on the price that I can take the chance to figure out if this horse is going to run well on a dry racetrack and a different racetrack. I think in normal situations, you have these big performances of horses that run on the slop and then they come back and they're favored. Uh, promise keeper is not going to be favored. So I think that this is an opportunity to try to take that chance that maybe that form will translate. Maybe this horse is improving and he's being trained by a guy that uh, obviously knows how to get three-year-olds into the starting gate of the Kentucky Derby. You make a good case for promise keeper. I was thinking it was going to be tricky just in terms of dynamics. And I I wasn't sure if he wasn't going to catch some money just because that figure came back strong enough last time. But I mean, if the morning line of eight to one is right, uh, 
Of course, when we're betting our picks, we won't we won't know that. So well, I, I think it'll be about- five. I think it'll be five to one. Okay. Um, but I'm okay with that. Todd Pletcher and a three year old derby prep, five to one. Where do I sign? <laughs> I like it. I'm gonna go. I I just couldn't get off of Candyman Rocket. Honestly, I I feel like I mean you mentioned about the inside not being historically where you want to be at Tampa. This one ended up back down there and still showed guts and determination. I thought to get the job done. I like his push button look. I feel like he can let other speed go, stay in touch. The hands that he's in, I really like this one. Second time going long, I had. I mean, I liked him the last day, but I did have some questions about him in terms of the distance. And I think between having run the distance once and run over the track, he's definitely one I want as an A. And I'm also a little bit interested in another one coming out of that same race in the eight hidden stash. Yes, I think the pace was run to set up a closer the last day, but this is now second off a significant layoff. Another horse who was down inside for a big part of that race, though granted swung out late uh, to make the ru- the actual run. Um, may have been a little flattered, but I still think could move forward and feels like a horse that could be maybe a little bit better than that four to one of the morning line the, in picks. And I think has a decent chance to be the best closer. And I definitely do see a scenario here. Let's say Candyman Rocket and uh, uh, the horse that you mentioned on the outside, Promise Keeper, and, and some of these others make this an unsustainable pace. The stash could be the beneficiary of that. Do you like that one at all, or were you just thinking it was going to be too far back? No, I mean, he's the type of horse you can definitely use. Um, and I, and I, I agree, he had some excuses in the last race. Um, just not one on top. And in the morning line, I actually think that those those they could flip. I think maybe Hidden Stash could end up being uh, the third choice and Promise Keeper the second choice. But, um, he, you know, he's one you want to use in multi-race bets. If I'm not mistaken, I, I could be lying, but you'll find out. But I, I'm pretty sure there's a cross-country pick five. Uh, that includes this race so you know and if you're not playing the pick five there it's actually a pretty fun card too um I, he, he's one that i would definitely use uh, but i'm going to lean on the three and the 11 is like my kind of my key a horses i definitely i definitely get it so oh and that's good so you're you're not like anti anti the three you no. just think the three is is going to potentially be absolutely hammered and, and that is a concern uh yeah. five to two though for fixed odds listeners and viewers uh, five to two, you can get on Candyman Rocket right now. That's always, you know, sometimes that colors the picks that I give out because I, I get wedded to them at their their fixed odds numbers. When we were talking about the the Ryan X Line runner in the San Felipe Dream Shake, do I want if if Dream Shake is the five to one of the morning line? Do I want him into the teeth of life is good? Probably not. But you can bet him right now at twelve to one, and I mean to me that's an excellent value and then you'd play him in the forecast the, the exacto with uh with life is good and uh and, and cover your bases that way i've got deeper analysis of the pick of the three-year-old preps over at at the races.com if folks want to check that out if you want more on tampa bay we've got that too i do believe there is a cross-country pick five and i think uh tyler wisman's going to be writing about that for plus and then blake jesse and drew and i will be back tomorrow morning going over the other stakes at Tampa. And there's a whole bunch of them. Have you, have you looked at the, the rest of the Tampa card yet? No, I just saw that. I saw that horse in the hall. Oh, let me tell you which one I'm talking about. Cause this is a, this is a good one in race nine. Uh, Miss Tehran. It's a horse. Watch her last replay. Uh, Miss Tehran. She's the eight horse in race nine. Watch her replay at Goldstream park. This Philly uh, after she won, I remember texting Chad Brown the Roadrunner gif. She, her <laughs> turn of foot was like nothing I've ever seen before. She has got a sickening uh, turn of foot, and she's a six to one on the morning line. I don't think that'll hold. That's interesting. Okay, there, there's another one for your your fixed odds people tuning in. Miss Tehran in uh, what was it? Race number nine. That's the mile and eight, the Hillsborough Stakes. For more on that. Tune in to uh, plus in the money podcast.com slash plus. We'll get you there before we get out of here. Let's just talk about what happened yesterday at, uh, at golden gate. You know, I couldn't resist making the easy jokes on Twitter about the protests at, at golden gate. But, you know, I do think this is a matter worth talking about. I think it's connected in many ways to some of the conversations we had uh, early in the week with Nick luck about the, 
Gordon Elliott fiasco and the uh, concept of horse racing's social license to operate. JK, what was your take on what you saw last night at Golden Gate Fields? Well, the first thing is, is uh, I, I do want to say that, that, that I believe in uh, people's right to protest in this country, uh, whether I agree with what they're, they're protesting or not. Um, I prefer those protests be peaceful. Um, but the nature of protests is they have to be, they have to be disruptive or what it doesn't, what are you doing? Um, but I guess my problem is, is that I, I'm more mad at racing. I think because I don't still think we've done a great job of taking ourselves seriously and getting out the message that, 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 that we care about these animals and we treat these animals the same way that, that people treat their pets. And, and that I feel like that's a message that, that gets lost and it annoys me to that whole idea we talk about on these airwaves all the time about this fractured system that we're in of racing where everyone's worried about their piece of the pie. And there's not a lot of collaboration and cooperation to a common goal because to me, just brainstorming on a phone call today, like, like in the car is like, like, why don't we have, why don't the Stronic group, uh, Churchill, Naira, the jockey club, uh, all the ADWs, why don't we pull together Breeders' Cup, pull together a million dollars and have a great 30 second ad Super Bowl Sunday showing how much we love these animals, showing people hugging and loving and caring for these animals. Uh, but, but instead, it's just like that, you know, we're, we're just all fighting about dumb stuff with each other. And and uh, and, and that's the that's the thing. These people that are that were laying on the racetrack, they they've developed this idea in their brain that, that this is a, a harmful sport to these animals and that we don't love these animals and that everyone in this, that's involved in this game is the handful of idiots that we've seen over time. Uh, not, not, not excluding last week. So it's unfortunate. It's frustrating. And uh, you know, I, I think racing has got to take themselves seriously and do a better job of, of controlling the message and, and getting a better message out there. I think that's really super duper well said. And again, you know, I'm, I was the first one making jokes, but you, you can make jokes and still, you know, in the moment and still take things seriously in the big picture of life. And, you know, for me, don't think for a minute it's not connected to the Gordon Elliott stuff. And I, I have a new uh, least favorite category of human on, on social media, JK. It used to be the, it used to be the COVID deniers. Now it's, now it's the, the Elliott uh, defenders. Now look, I'm not saying you can't say something completely reasonable, like there shouldn't be physical harm involved in in the punishment. Like, sure. But there's too many people out there being like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a one-time thing. Let's move on. Which is just so wrong for all the reasons you're saying. There is a definite connection to that powerful, powerful image. I mean, I felt the visceral power of that image myself and how it changed my reaction. Not that I was ever like ready to move on and and defend, but... you know, you see an image like that, it's very easy to go from, okay, let's have all the facts and react in a measured appropriate response just to, you know, wanting to commit violence, which is, you know, basically the reaction that I had seeing that. And and I have a feeling it was probably one of the things that helped, uh, you know, the, the match that lit uh, the protest we saw the other day. And it needs to be taken seriously for all the reasons you said, like, we've got to do better about getting our message out there about the reality of what happens with our horses. And we've got to do better about punishing. And, you know, in some cases, uh, Elliot comes to mind, banning people who abuse that right in that relationship and call into question the social contract we have to operate. And yeah, so there was one guy who decided to pick a fight with me about it, JK. And, and, and you know, his, his conclusion that, you know, there shouldn't be physical violence Um, was, you know, I agree with that, but, you know, making a false equivalent claim about online bullying, like, I'm sorry, Gordon Elliott, we have several people in our social circle who have had personal dealings with them. One of them punched him in the face and he, he's not a guy who's been bullied. He is the bully. And I'm not going to sit here and and, and not say something when that gets compared to a a woman with mental illness who literally gets bullied to death. 
So that's why I had to say something. And, you know, I tried to smooth it over. That person clearly was spoiling for a fight. So in the end, JK, I took a page out of your book. I wrote them, not DM. I, maybe I should have DM, but I, I wrote it publicly. I said, get bent turkey. And then I hit the block button. What do you think? <laughs> I, I ripped that page out and threw it in the trash. I just ignore them jokers now. I don't got that's time prob- for it. Probably healthier. Probably healthier. But I, I, I must say I couldn't, uh, I couldn't yeah, resist. And, and, look, and not to go down a rabbit hole, but like, you know, I struggle with cancel culture because I feel like, you know, people make mistakes and then we want to just rip everything they have away from them and give them zero opportunity to, for redemption. But you don't get redemption a week later after the, 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 the S storm that you created, <laughs> you know, maybe five years from now or, or maybe three or four years from now was some really good work uh, of showing that you're sorry it, it, you know, maybe you can kind of regain some of what you had, but it's not a weak thing. Like you don't, you don't get to do something that's so disruptive and then everyone forgets about it uh, a week later. It, it, there's a process to this, you know, and, and, um, and it's, there's certain things that are undefensible, right. Which is like indefensible, which is like kids and animals, you know, like you, you can't do, you can call me a name on Twitter. You can call me the bad name on Twitter. I'm an adult. I can handle it. You can be canceled for a little bit, but if you hurt kids or you're hurting animals, you know, your, your punishment's going to be a little bit longer. Yeah. You make so many good points. You're wise beyond your years. If people didn't know, they might think you were a baby boomer, JK. Well, I don't have a beard like yours. Mine's shorter. My hat is a little bit different. And I to don't have it, any. I don't have any rock and roll albums behind. To, me, to make it worse, to make it worse, I'm wearing a Wilco T-shirt. I'm not helping my cause here. I'm not helping my cause here one bit. Oh my goodness! All right, I think that is enough of that, J.K. Unless you have any closing thoughts, either serious stuff about that issue or anything else happening this weekend. No, I just want to remind our listeners uh, that that our friends uh, on both coasts are having contests this weekend. Three thousand dollar buy-ins in both of them. Um, hurry if you want to play in the new york one i think they're closing (laughs) in about 15 minutes yeah you gotta hurry up Uh, i think they are still open i think it's 5 p.m eastern today so yeah 5 p.m eastern um both of them have similar rules i need to read through the rules but i think both you have to bet five races maybe um the 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 ubc the santa anita Gulfstream one you can bet both places obviously the the gotham is is going to be strictly new york but uh some fun contests some fun opportunities so so get involved i like the sound of it will we see your name on uh, either leaderboard well, you won't see my name. <laughs> Wait a second. What you won't see what my are you name. Tra- what are you- All right. I don't want to get no. you in trouble, but I feel like we have no, to leave no, no, that no, alone. I'm not getting in trouble. This is just a Texas thing. I, I just, I'm, I'm uh, rooting for some friends. I don't gotcha. Know. Okay. Let's see. We'll see how JK's posse does in these, uh, who will be playing non collusively, I might add. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, yeah. None, of, none of that funny business. Just, yeah. you know. Gotcha. Just leg- legality. I always for- I forget about your. I forget. I-, I say Planet Texas on every show. It's that I-, I forget your state's retrograde attitudes when it comes to advanced deposit wagering. Maybe yeah, some. I can't. <laughs> I can't have an ADW, but you don't have to wear a mask here either. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that that's a rabbit hole too far. <laughs> We're gonna cut it there. Um, you're are you double vaxxed yet, or are you you about to get there? Um, I'm in route. In You're in route. Okay. One, one, one and done. I get my first next week. And the great news is, looks like we're going to be able to do something um, with our friends at TaylorMade. Might as well announce it. Uh, Derby week. Looks like we'll be able to participate in an event. We will have had the double jab. We encourage listeners to get it too and hopefully come see us in Lexington, uh, Kentucky Derby week. Much, many more details about that and our relationship with, uh, with TaylorMade and Medallion Racing will be revealed in the coming weeks. Okay. Thank you, JK. Thanks to Billy Koch. Thanks to DJ Unstable himself, producer Craig Gorbanoff. Thanks to our founding partners, 10 Strike Racing and the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. To find out more about the great work TRF is up to, go to trfinc.org slash players. Give to them. Support their cause. Most of all, thanks to all of you, the listeners and viewers, for making these shows so much fun to do. This show's been a production of In The Money Media. Our business manager is Drew Cotney. Our chief creative officer is Jonathan Ginchin. I'm Peter Thomas Fornital. May you win all your photos.
trust me 